continuing our lectures on x-ray diffraction. And uh, what I have here is an early diffraction pattern. And uh, for the most part, uh, with the exception of single crystal diffraction, um, diffractometers give you a spectra. So you have to figure things out from looking at a line on the screen. Uh, but the early days of diffraction, uh, namely Lau diffraction uh, by a scientist with the last name of Lau, and we'll talk about this uh, person later, um, generated diffraction patterns that look very much like what you see on uh, TEMs. So X-ray diffractometry uh, looks a lot like um, X or electron diffraction um, if you look at it from a pattern point of view. And so what we have here is we have a diffracted beam and we have a, um, sorry, we have the center beam is the transmitted beam, excuse me, dope. And the other beams are the diffracted beams. And uh, these uh, spots are patterns. And depending on the crystal structure and the orientation of your crystal, um, you will uh, have a different pattern. And uh, kind of learning how to interpret these uh, orientations kind of becomes a, a good art. We'll talk a lot more about pattern-based diffractometry when we talk about transmission electron microscopy. But I kind of wanted just to throw this out here uh, where just to show you all that the um, earlier forms of X-ray diffraction were exclusively pattern-based. Uh, we didn't have, uh, our society didn't have the technology uh, to create a spectra um, from uh, an incoming uh, photon beam, basically. Uh, right now, we're going to uh, talk about absorption and transmittance, and uh, we're going to talk about the attenuation of x-rays, and uh, this becomes pertinent particularly when you're talking about x-ray shielding um, and um, if you're also doing pass-through filters, and so we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in great length. Um, the uh, di dx, uh, the change in intensity over the change in distance, um, is equal to negative mu times um, the distance. I'm sorry, times the intensity. So negative mu times the intensity. So the amount of uh, attenuation a beam will encounter as it goes through a, uh, a substance of thickness x, um, we can we can um, express this in terms of negative mu times i, which is the intensity. And mu is the linear absorption coefficient. And we'll talk about linear absorption coefficient um, in pretty good detail. And it's related parameter, the mass absorption coefficient, uh, which is basically mu divided by density of a material. And uh, linear absorption coefficient is a, is a material constant, but it's only constant based on the radiation that it's being hit with. So for a given radiation, uh, you have a given mu or mu over rho, um, which is a linear absorption coefficient over the density. To kind of talk about this uh, a little bit more, we'll kind of look at an application uh, that I was involved in a few years back, and it had to do with CubeSat. And uh, the CubeSat program is a uh, kind of a small base satellite. And um, the idea here is you can put a bunch of satellites in space uh, with the with the same payload as roughly uh, a big satellite, you can put out hundreds of satellites. Okay, so I'll just kind of leave that um, there. Um, they've done uh, 3D printing of uh, using stereolithography and putting in electronics. This actually went into a, a CubeSat. Um, Made in Space is a company that you all may have heard of uh, who kind of pioneered making a fused filament fabrication printer that went on the International Space Station. So this was actually printed on in, on the International Space Station or in space. And the CubeSat program is actually pretty neat. And um, we were involved in a project uh, at one point in time where we were trying to prove that you could make an all printed CubeSat in space. So you have 3D printers, fused filament fabrication printers on the space station. You just need better materials. And uh, one of the materials that we were interested in looking at was actually radiation shielding. So that's actually pertinent to uh, this um, talk that I'm, I'm giving right now. Um, so if you look, and it's not just space-based applications, uh, it's radiation shielding for any application, but uh, we had put out a paper um, that kind of talked about this, and it's directly pertinent to the subject matter uh, that we have here for X-ray diffraction. And so we have the Beer-Lambert law, 
And the Beer-Lambert law tells us um, that the intensity of your X-ray after it is passed through a material, in this case a shield, um, is going to be equal to the um, initial intensity times the exponent of mu over rho times rho x. Okay, so mu is the linear absorption coefficient, uh, rho is the density of the material, and that's again the density of the material. And so this is a convention thing, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, what we were doing was we were dealing with thermoplastic based printers. And so we wanted to make a tunable radiation shielding. And so if you want to calculate how well your tunable shielding is going to perform, you have to get a, a mass absorption coefficient for your mixture. So um, mu over rho for M uh, mixture um, equals uh, the mass fraction of your first substance plus the mass fraction of your second substance uh, multiplied by the respective uh, mass absorption coefficients. Okay, so in this case, we were doing tungsten and polycarbonate. You can get the mass absorption coefficient of tungsten and polycarbonate and whatever percentage uh, you're using of each, you just kind of plug in chug. Um, this is kind of an important thing uh, to think about the density. Okay, so if I have a mixture of uh, iron and carbon, I put it in a bag and then somehow you know, make some sort of shield out of it. I glue it together or something with a, some sort of binder with the amount being somewhat inconsequential. Um, you can calculate your nominal density based on another uh, rule of mixture type of equation. However, if I make cementite, it's not gonna have the same density. Okay, so this is only um, working if I have, I guess more of an amalgam versus an alloy. If it's a, if it's a true mixture, versus I made a different chemical compound. Uh, that's where these equations hold true. And these are rule of mixtures uh, types of equations. Um, law of averages uh, would be volume fraction, rule of mixtures, mass fraction. Uh, so don't you, want, you don't want to forget that. And then uh, here's some results. And I uh, kind of put the citation uh, before I put it in the picture. Uh, but this is, uh, we, we kind of talked about it in different articles. So I'll show uh, kind of the results of this stuff from, from two different articles. And uh, so percent x-ray transmitted. So polycarbonate actually has a pretty good propensity to block x-rays on its own. And so um, we were only getting 9% uh, um, x-rays uh, transferred through uh, with just polycarbonate. Um, the uh, shields were actually one centimeter. So it was actually uh, kind of cool for this specific radiation source, okay? Uh, when we added 1% uh, by weight tungsten going all the way up to 5, you can see a pretty good decrease in the amount of uh, x-ray radiation uh, that went through. And then here's some examples. These are actually IZOD impact tests uh, that we did for this study. So this is pure polycarbonate, polycarbonate loaded with 1% tungsten going all the way to 5% tungsten. And uh, you can see the difference in just the color um, that uh, occurred by loading more and more tungsten. And it was pretty cool because for a really, really low weight percent, we were able to block out a reasonably high amount of uh, X radiation um, according to, uh, to our results. Um, this is another graph um, and they changed the X ray energy. And uh, one thing that you, you want to kind of realize is that uh, your X radiation or your X ray shielding. Um, your mass absorption coefficients will change depending on the energy of your x-rays. Um, the x radiation, um, I'm kind of asking you to think about this, kind of bring things that we talked about in the previous lecture with this lecture. So the shielding ability goes down as the x-ray energy goes up. And I don't know why I put a question mark there. Uh, what do you think this means in terms of wavelength? Okay, well, as the wavelength gets shorter, the energy goes up. Okay, so... Um, you have to kind of think of things in terms of, of that. So you'll still get some good shielding. Um, the X-ray energy, the wavelength is actually shorter here. So think about that. I always remember E equals HC over Lambda. And uh, anyway, it was pretty cool. So the, the point of this graph was uh, we were looking at attenuation factor and, and, and as opposed to percent X-ray transmitted. And uh, I'll kind of show you the differences uh, that and the way you kind of want to think about how to use these equations on the next slide. Um, but the um, line was our model that we used, which was basically based on Beer's law. And uh, the points that we actually measured matched up pretty well with the model. So that was actually pretty good. That's what you, you want to see uh, if you're an experimentalist working with a modeler anyway. 
Um, so anyway, I'm going to go on to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about uh, attenuation factor uh, versus percent x-rays transmitted. Um, so if we look at the same graph, okay, I just changed the axes. Um, I made it look a little prettier here, but I changed the um, y-axis um, on either one. So this was the kind of the data we published, and we were publishing attenuation factor. So attenuation factor is um, ix over i naught, which we saw before. And we saw that negative mu intensity equals this, but um, the attenuation factor is also equal, according to Beer's law, um, the E um, times the mass absorption coefficient times the density times X. And so this is more practical because you can calculate the thickness, okay? Um, the other way was, was uh, kind of more of like a derivative kind of looking thing. Um, the amount transmitted, okay, is IX. And uh, so this is um, expressed as a percent. So more x-rays are transmitted at higher energies. And sometimes I find it easier to look at the data in terms of amount transmitted versus attenuation factor. Um, it depends on what kind of day I'm having, actually, I'll be honest with you. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of cover that. So always pay attention to the um, what's being asked and how the data is presented and uh, what kind of language you're using, okay? So amount transmitted would be IX. If they report attenuation factor, it's IX over I naught. And uh, we can go over a problem uh, here very shortly. All right, mass absorption coefficients. Uh, I've posted a handout on Blackboard uh, giving some tabularized mass absorption coefficients. Um, sometimes this data is actually kind of hard to find, but I, I found another uh, database of mass absorption coefficients uh, that I'm happy to show you, and I'll show you in this lecture. Uh, the, it's a parameter that characterizes a given material's ability to absorb x-rays. Um, it's essentially the linear absorption coefficient divided by the density, and we kind of talked about this already. If you have a mixture, mass absorption coefficients can be calculated from the rule of mixtures. Again, if you've made a new chemical compound, that new chemical compound will not have the same density, and it will actually even have different mass absorption parameters or linear absorption parameters. And generally, the um, linear absorption coefficient slash mass absorption coefficient um, for a chemical compound is also tabulated in its own database. Uh, the tables I'm providing on Blackboard are, are strictly elemental based. But I'll show you another source um, for this uh, type of data. Um, so here's uh, an example. I'm sorry, it's kind of bad. I got it out of an old book, uh, but it's a uh, table mass absorption coefficients. Um, and I kind of cut it off. This is just showing the uh, an example. Uh, we have this for all of the uh, elements um, on the periodic table, I believe, or most of the elements on the periodic table. I guess we don't have some for some that don't really exist and some that don't exist in in room standard room temperatures. Um, but the mass absorption coefficient for a material will change depending on the source radiation. And so this is, uh, um, this column here is the absorber and I've cut off a few, but we have aluminum, which is a good metal um, to use. We also get the density. Um, so linear absorption coefficient divided by the density. This is tabulated by a convention and historically you could only find tables of mass absorption coefficients. Um, but I have another source I'll show you here in a bit. And uh, so this is the different x-ray source. Okay, so molybdenum, copper, cobalt, chromium. Uh, this is, if you look at the sources, these, the author of this table was only really caring about x-ray diffractometry because these are pretty common um, x-ray diffract, uh, diffractometer sources, uh, copper and cobalt being the most common. And... Um, um, if you look at aluminum, so aluminum for copper K alpha, the mass absorption coefficient is 50.23. For K beta, it's less. Uh, aluminum, it's even higher for cobalt. So aluminum is actually a pretty good shield for cobalt K alpha anyway. And it's super high for chromium. Um, but see, it's not always the case. So the numbers vary. And sometimes they vary by quite a bit uh, between uh, the X-ray source. And sometimes you can see differences in orders of magnitude. So let's look um, sulfur, which I don't know if I'd want to make a shield out of sulfur. Uh, copper K beta 68, um, but if you look at uh, chromium, it's 281.9. So sulfur actually absorbs uh, chromium K alpha uh, very, very well. Um, again, Beer-Lambert law, um, if you look at how the equations actually operate, density cancels out. 
Um, for beer Lambert loss, you're really only caring about the linear absorption coefficient, but you have to use this flavor of an equation uh, because the data is given to you in terms of rho over, or sorry, mu over rho. Um, if you have the linear absorption coefficient, your beer Lambert law changes, right? So if you have the linear absorption coefficient, which is strictly mu, and the units of mu in this case are centimeters to the negative one, you don't have to worry about density. And uh, the question is, well, where do I get this data? Because uh, sometimes this data is actually hard to find. Um, NIST, the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has made this great database. And um, I'm going to show you kind of an example of me using it and hold on. There we go. So you can pick uh, whatever material you want. In this case, I'm picking iron. I didn't turn the volume off, but that's okay. Uh, but you also get linear uh, linear coefficient and um, you can pick the range and you can get the data and you can play around with this you have the link so play around with it if you like um, and so it gives you a whole range of data you get a graph um, you also get edge absorptions uh, which we'll talk about later uh, but this actually gives you edge absorptions for a wide range of um, orbitals right so we have k we have the multiple m's and then we have uh, the multiple L's as well. And sometimes L and M overlap in terms of uh, energies and stuff like that, uh, absorption, edge absorptions. And we'll talk about the absorption edge, uh, but first let us work out a problem. All right, so I have a problem we're going to work through and I'll read it along with you. Um, so say you have an X-ray generator and you want to block out 99% of the x-rays. So you want to shield yourself pretty well. And so let me use my highlighter here. So 99% of the x-rays. Um, you have some iron and uh, you want to make a shield out of this iron. And how thick should your sample be? And uh, so we're gonna use the um, Beer-Lambert law Oops, got a little. This is supposed to be mu over density. Mu over density, um, density x. So we're going to solve for x. So this is um, how much is passing through, what the original was, e. Um, mu over p, and I wrote it very sloppily. Let me, I can do a little better than that sometimes. Then rho x, and uh, so i to the x, uh, that's much is going to pass through. Um, i naught e to the negative um, mu over rho times rho x, and we're going to solve for x. And um, kind of highlight that. That's what we're solving for. And if you want to kind of draw it out, we have this shield we're trying to make. We have these x rays kind of coming through. It's supposed to be an arrowhead. Again, I can do better than that. And don't get confused with x-rays and distance x. And we're going to solve for the distance x. So we're going to see how thick um, we want this to be. So some things you want to look at. So you want to pay attention to the terminology. And so we want to block out 99% of the x-rays, which means only 1% uh, is going to pass through. So I, Ix, um, we already know it's going to be 1%. 1%. Um, I naught would be 100, 100% passing through, and this is only 1% passing through. Uh, you can convert this to a number, and then I naught kind of goes away. And uh, so Ix, you can say, and then you can say um, I naught is equal to 1. So you can rewrite your equation and in terms of just the numbers we've just substituted ix and i naught for. 
And so that's one, so we can just say e to the negative um, mu over rho times density times x. So we're gonna have to solve for x. So we have an exponent, we know we need a natural log for that. So let's uh, plug in the numbers before we uh, plug in chug. Um, the numbers we wanna use, um, oops, come off this, uh, I just made a big boo-boo. Boom, pasted my highlighting. Um, the numbers we want come off of a table. And the table we want is this table that I tried to put in, but I put in highlighting by accident. And uh, let's uh, kind of scroll it down. Um, we can make it bigger. And I covered up my equation here. Boom. And I think this is big enough. We can also zoom in. Um, so we have our different uh, our different uh, values we want. So our absorber, in this case, our absorber is going to be iron. And uh, we're dealing with cobalt K alpha, if we go back and look. So cobalt K alpha. So these are the critical parameters we want to look at um, here on our um, table. Sometimes on tests, people get the absorber and the x-ray source mixed up. So just to be kind of courteous, I don't use cobalt as an absorber on test problems because that causes trouble for people. They actually get the concept, but they made a mistake. Maybe they were nervous or whatnot. So we're dealing with iron. And uh, so iron, if I follow along, is 56.25. So that's the value for iron. Um, I kind of goofed, I covered it up with my pen. And let me use a different highlighter uh, to make it a little more clear for you all. And iron 56.25, so iron 56.25, don't use the cobalt number. So 56.25 is our mu over rho. Uh, density is nicely given to us and a lot of people have this memorized. It's a common uh, metal used by metallurgists to make steel and, this and the like. Um, so we can rewrite our equation. So 0 0.01 equals um, 56.25. And we can use, uh, oops, you know I made this sloppy. And I apologize. And I actually had forgotten the exponent. Dope. So e to the negative 56.25. Five. This is centimeters squared per gram. Always remember the units. Um, the density is 7.87 um, grams per centimeters cubed. And I'm making this a little sloppy. Let me try a little harder. Sorry about this, y'all. All right, 7.87 grams times x. And x is going to be in centimeters. So x has to be in centimeters for the units to cancel out. That's why I always write out the units. Because um, this would be dimensionless, right? 0 0.01. Is, is rads per rad, if we look at the other slides we've done. Um, anywho, or unit per unit. Anyway, this has to be dimensionless. Hopefully you can read my sloppy, sloppy writing. Um, it's a little bit hard on a tablet. All right, so um, LN 0 0.01 equals um, LN E and then let me write it again just to make it a little neater. I'm going to only put the numbers just to save space. Seven point eight seven x. Okay. So ln zero point zero one. Um, I have a calculator somewhere. I can't do that in my head. And. Somebody borrowed it from my office, but let me fire it up. Sorry about that. 
7.87 and follow along. Um, I implore you to. Oops, ln 0 0.01, dope. So I got negative 4.6, I'm gonna round up, 4.61. And uh, this equals to this ln and the e are gonna cancel out. So it's simply uh, 50, or negative um, 56.25 times 7.87. And I got 442 point, we'll round that up, 69x, and we know x is going to be in centimeters, and it's a negative, and so we want to divide this by 4.61. All right, so we've worked out a problem with uh, mass absorption coefficient, and uh, now we're going to talk about the absorption edge. And the absorption edge is another material property, and it's dependent on the radiation hitting it. And uh, the, if I read my own slides, the critical wavelength that has the energy to ionize an atom or basically knock a given electron out of its shell. Okay, and uh, you saw on this uh, NIST slide that their absorption edges uh, can occur for different specific radiations. And um, I could probably figure out which one this is. I think this is K, K for um, iron and aluminum. But the absorption edges is uh, very interesting when you're developing an X-ray diffraction system. So if you remember, you want to have uh, monochromatic X-rays to perform X-ray diffraction, because if you're performing diffraction with multiple wavelengths, you'll get a lot of peaks and it will be impossible to interpret your data. Okay, so you have to know what, what radiation you're using. And uh, the absorption edge kind of works like this. I'm gonna explain it on this slide, then I kind of explain it again on another slide using a figure from Cullity, um, but let me get my laser pointer. Um, so for iron, which is the black line, and aluminum, which is the red line, they have different absorption edges, and this is, I believe this is K, okay? Um, it didn't specify, but I'm, I'm guessing just by the energies, it's K. So your mass absorption coefficient, so it's going up, going up, going up, going up as your wavelength increases, right? So if my wavelength increases, the energy is actually getting lower, so I'm able to, I'm able to absorb more energy. But here we have this kind of interesting phenomena where it just sharply dives, it takes a nose dive. And what's happening here is you're ionizing an electron. Okay, so the energy, if you remember, electrons are given energy levels, okay? And if they have an energy, they also have a wavelength. This wavelength is also gonna have an energy. So when the energy of your incoming X-ray matches the energy of your um, electron, or if you want to think of it in terms of the wavelength, if the wavelength of your incoming X-ray matches the wavelength of that electron, they're going to do a little dance, basically, okay? And it's going to, boom, knock that electron out. If it's not there, okay, it's going to either be too low for the electron to care about, or it's going to be too high for the electron to care about, and the X-ray is going to be looking for higher energy electrons. So when the energy or wavelength of the X-ray is matching the energy or wavelength of the electron, they're going to collide, basically. And that electron is going to be ionized. Now, what that means is you've knocked this electron out of the way. So it's kind of like the battle droids going through the Gungan shields in episode one, if you will. That um, X-ray is going to be able to pass through pretty easily. Okay, And so what happens now is you have this point where the x-rays are passing through. So it's not a good absorber anymore. And then it takes a little while for it to recover its behavior in terms of wavelength. And we see that aluminum and iron have different um, edge absorptions. And, and I'm guessing this is K. At the very least, it's the same um, radiation um, that's uh, 
being talked about, I believe. Anyway, different absorption edges, okay? If we look at it, and here we are, they're the little cusps. If we look at it from kind of a different point of view, um, so this is uh, talking about nickel, and uh, nickel is important to copper radiation, and I'll show you why in a bit. But here's the critical energy for the wavelength of an electron from nickel, and we have this spike, and so this is the absorption edge of nickel. And so the absorption edge of nickel um, occurs a little bit below 1.5. And um, the energy of the X-ray uh, matches that of the electron. So think levels. Um, here, the material is absorbing a lot. After you get this, uh, hit this absorption edge, the absorbance decreases. Well, why do we even care about this, man? Why am I trying to wrap my mind around this? Well, you can use it as a filter. And for whatever reason, I put it in terms of nanometers, but 1.48 um, is the nickel edge. Uh, 1.54 is uh, K-alpha, and 1.38, and I'm talking angstroms, but I'm showing nanometers, I'm sorry. So 0 0.138 nanometers, 0 0.154 nanometers, and the nickel edge is right in between. Well, if I overlay what we see for the absorption edge, Nickel had a really, really good propensity to absorb radiation right here at the K-beta area, but it was substantially decreased because of where the absorption edge lies, so K-alpha can pass through. And so what we're doing is we're essentially creating a K-beta uh, filter. So we're filtering out the K-beta. We're only letting the K-alpha pass through. And that's important because we want our diffracting beam to be monochromatic. We can't have polychromatic beams creating diffraction because you'd have peaks all over the place or dots all over the place and you wouldn't be able to make sense of what was what. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, a drawback to using a nickel filter or any metallic filter or a so-called pass-through filter is that you also attenuate the radiation you care about. So if you look, the intensity of K-alpha is decreased. Uh, with and without the filter. So this is no filter. This is with the filter. I was backwards with my mouse pointing. I apologize. Um, but no filter. K-alpha is more intense. But the benefit of using the filter is you've gotten rid of K-beta, so you'll actually have uh, less peaks to confuse you. Um, here's different material filter materials. And all these materials um, have the absorption edge lying between the K-alpha and K-beta of your uh, target. So for molybdenum, zirconium is a good filter. For copper, we've talked extensively about nickel. For cobalt, iron is a good filter. Um, for iron, okay, um, manganese is a good filter. And for chromium, vanadium is a good filter. So uh, it's pretty cool. It actually gives you, it's funny, it gives it to you in terms of inches. Um, so anyway, again, from BD Colody, written in the 50s, seminal work on uh, X-ray diffractometry. Um, here is the absorption edge. So I'm going to give you this table as well. And it's pretty much every element or most of the elements um, on the periodic table, uh, giving you their K alpha, K alpha 2, K alpha 1, and K beta. And we have the weighted average, uh, which again, the weighted average is in terms are in favor of K alpha. So it's 2 times K alpha um, plus K alpha 2 divided by 3. That's the weighted average. You don't get K-beta doublets, which is kind of interesting, but we also get the absorption edge um, for our elements here. And, and note, we don't have the weighted average for everything. So not every material uh, gives a discernible K-alpha doublet. Um, so if you look at these numbers, it's not really worth it to try to weight, weight it out. Um, I think it's funny because Brandon and Kaplan, uh, they borrow Cullody's graph almost exactly. They discolor it and then don't give Cullody credit. So if you go and you look, uh, this Cullody's graph, this one here, they've repeated it here and put it in nanometers instead of angstrom. So I guess they don't get uh, copyright uh, infringement. Uh, but anyway, instead of using a pass-through filter, uh, you can use a bent monochromator. And uh, we have this on uh, our X-ray diffractometer. Uh, sometimes, though, uh, K-beta can bleed through, uh, which is kind of interesting depending on what you're looking at. And I've actually seen that with a student because um, we uh, recalculated some of uh, her peaks uh, based off of uh, what K-beta is. It was kind of an interesting thing. I've only seen that once uh, in all my years. Uh, but a bent monochromator is, is basically diffraction grading. 
And uh, what happens is only K alpha will satisfy the Bragg condition. And so in the next lecture, we're going to talk Bragg's law up to Bazango. Uh, but the, um, the key thing you want to know about Bragg's law is the fraction will only occur for, if you have a static D spacing, the fraction is only going to occur for one wavelength. Okay. And so this is going to be oriented. So you only have one um, angle. Okay. So it's like the uh, monochromator on the spectrometer that was moving. In this case, it's not moving. It's static. So only K beta is going to go through. And this is on the tube side. This is a filter within the X-ray tube. Okay. And so the filter would also be on the pass-through nickel thing would also be on the pass-through tube. So if I asked you on a quiz or a test, what's the drawback of using a metal pass-through filter such as nickel? The answer would be you would also attenuate K alpha. Okay, so part B, what would an alternative to a nickel pass-through filter be? Well, a monochromator that only allows K alpha to pass through based on diffraction condition. Okay, so think of it that way. Um, so the next lecture, we're going to talk about Bragg's Law and diffraction uh, very much. Um, this, these first two lectures were kind of uh, talking about x-rays, uh, specifically aspects about x-rays that pertain to um, x-ray diffractometry and, uh, and the understanding of which you kind of need to understand what's going on with x-ray diffractometry. Um, this is yet another good place to stop for now. So as always, I thank you for your time. Uh, be sure and pay attention to the uh, problem, the worked out problem we had in this video as well. You never know when that might come up again. And uh, have an awesome day. Oh my. It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.